welcome to today's lecture on transducers before i discuss about transducers let me give an introduction about the the need for transducers why really transducer interfacing is so important let us try to understand that uh, we are discussing embedded systems as you know microcontrollers are normally used to realize embedded systems and embedded systems interact with the environment normally a general purpose computer interacts with a human being the type of input output devices you require for that purpose is little different you require keyboard you require mouse you require a video display unit for interaction with the human being or user on the other hand whenever a trans a uh, microcontroller based system which is known as embedded system is interacting with the environment what do you really need what kind of input output devices you require for that purpose let us try to understand uh, the function of an embedded system typical function of an embedded system normally you will find that embedded system does monitoring monitoring of one or few physical parameters these physical parameters will depend on the uh, nature of application the, these uh, parameters can be temperature pressure flow light and so on and uh, and data acquisition it performs data acquisition related to this after that is being done the second operation that an embedded system does is processing of the acquired data processing of the acquired data as you know inside the microcontroller you have got the cpu memory so the acquired data is stored in the memory and then with the help of the cpu the processing is done then the third operation it does is controlling controlling of of the uh, physical parameters so you have to uh, uh, control those physical parameters like temperature pressure uh, uh, the light intensity and various other parameters so for that purpose again the the system must generate some signal so uh, you require uh, suitable input output devices for that purpose let us have a look at a general look at a general uh, block diagram of an embedded system here is your microcomputer you have got a cpu data memory uh, program memory and a number of io ports this forms your microcontroller now in addition to this you require some other devices for example here is your environment outside this uh, micro microcontroller this is your environment so this environment from the environment it has to get information about the physical parameters and for that purpose you will require transducers suitable transducers one or more transducers will be required and then output of the transducers will be fed to some circuit why it will be necessary we shall discuss at length you will require signal conditioner and output of the signal conditioner will be fed to one device called analog to digital converter which will de generate digital data and the digital data will be read through an io port and then it will read it send it to the data memory and then in this data memory it will be stored similarly you will also input some uh, some kind of uh, yes no on off type of signal with the help of optocouplers 
and also through IO port that information will be read and stored somewhere in the uh, processor. Similarly, you have to generate some analog signal for controlling some parameter that can be done with the help of digital to analog converters interface through IO ports. And similarly, some high voltage and high currents are to be con controlled and for that purpose you will require relays through interface through IO port to the microcontroller. So, you see these are the different types of input output devices will be required for uh, interfacing with the environment in embedded system. So, that the embed embedded system can interact with the environment, you will require these this type of input output devices. In four lectures, I shall cover all these devices that you require for implementing embedded system or in other words for interfacing uh, with the environment. That means the transducer, signal conditioner, ADCs, optocouplers, DACs, relays, these are the things which you shall cover in four lectures including this one. So, today we shall discuss about transducers. Let us try to understand uh, what is the function of a transducer. Why do you need a transducer and what is the function of a transducer? A transducer can be considered as an energy conversion device. So, this is your transducer. So, this transducer will take some input from the physical world, this is your physical world. So, physical, so from some physical world it will take input energy that energy will come in the form of temperature it can come in the form of pressure it can be flow it can be light, light intensity and so on. There can be many physical parameters and uh, it will generate some, it will convert that energy into electrical energy. So, the output will be electrical in nature. Output will be electrical and as you know, the electrical parameters are essentially uh, resistance, voltage, current and so on. So, it will produce here voltage, current and some resistance. And obviously, these parameters, these, vo these parameters, this voltage, current and resistance will change according to the physical parameters. So, uh, the transducer is necessary for converting energy from the physical energy to some electrical energy. And as we shall see, these uh, signals that will be generated will be usually analog in nature. And also, the analog signal strength will be very low. So, you will require some special type of hardware as we have discussed you will require uh, some signal conditioner so that it can do the interfacing with the transducer and the output that is being generated that is that analog signal that is comes from the transducer through signal condition gets converted into digital form with the help of AD converter. However, today we shall restrict our discussion to transducers and we shall discuss different types of transducers that are commonly used in our uh, various types of applications. Uh, first, we shall consider temperature transducer or, uh, or temperature sensors. Transducers are also called sensors. You will find temperature is possibly the most important physical parameter used in various applications. In our home appliances, we will find it is used in the geyser used in toaster, used in various home appliances. It is used in automobile, in car to sense the engine temperature. It is used in uh, instrumentation to sense uh, say the temperature of an oven or a heater or in process control say for example, to control the temperature of a furnace 
as I said in automobile also you require uh, monitoring of temperature. So there are numerous applications you can think of where temperature transducer is used. So we shall discuss different temperature transducers one after the other. Possibly the simplest and the most popular transducer is resistance thermometer. Resistance thermometer is based on the very simple property as you know uh, the resistance of a metal changes with uh, temperature and uh, you have studied in your uh, physics uh, I mean in school day physics the, the temperature of the metal changes uh, with temperature and there is positive temperature coefficient and the commonly used materials that are used for making resistance thermometer are platinum, copper, nickel and nickel iron. Nickel iron is a nickel iron is an alloy and these are the temperature ranges minus 200 degree centigrade to plus 850 degree centigrade and the temperature range as you can see here varies from minus 200 degree centigrade to 850 degree centigrade and the equation that follows uh, that is uh, they call the, temp the the resistance the temperature relationship is given by this RT is equal to R0 into 1 plus A, uh, AT plus BT square plus CT cube into uh, T minus T minus 100. This is the relationship of the uh, resistance uh, that, that varies with the temperature. So RT is the temperature resistance at temperature T you can say and these are the uh, temperatures AT plus BT square plus CT cube into T minus 100. Now uh, here A, B, C are constants and it has been found that over a small range uh, we can consider it is linear over a small range. It is linear. Now how a resistance thermometer is uh, made? Usually on a ceramic small cylinder that thin wire is owned. Then this is housed in a Pyrex tube and it, then it is hermetically sealed and two wires come out from this. So this is the general structure of a resistance thermometer. So very thin wire is here uh, and so that and this device this is also very small in size so that you can easily put it in the environment. And uh, this uh, platinum resistance thermometer has been found to be uh, very popular because of a uh, wide temperature range as you can see here minus 200 degree centigrade to plus 850 degree centigrade. So wide temperature range, wide temperature range. Not only that it has got uh, other properties like uh, it has got best sensitivity, sensitivity that means the change of resistance is more uh, in case of platinum compared to other met other um, other uh, metals then it, it is also uh, gives you uh, relatively a good linearity on the other hand copper uh, operates over a small temperature range from minus 100 degree centigrade to plus 260 degree centigrade and it gives you best linearity So whenever you want very high linearity uh, over a small temperature range say minus 100 degree centigrade to plus 260 degree centigrade then copper is the best material to choose. Then you have got nickel here also the temperature range is very small and in this particular case you get uh, low cost and uh, here also it is high sensitivity.
low cost and high sensitivity. Same is true for nickel iron. Here also it is of low cost and high sensitivity. So you can choose any one of the four types of resistance thermometer that is which are commercially available depending on the temperature range, depending on the sensitivity you require and so on. And the most popular one is the um, platinum resistance thermometer. For example, there is a device called PT100. It is one of the very widely used and popular resistance thermometer commercially available. PT100 stands for the resistance is 100, uh, 100 ohms at 0 degree centigrade. And uh, as the uh, temperature changes, this resistance of this cha also changes according to this relationship. And so this, uh, this particular resistance, 100 ohms resistance can be very accurately measured. However, the change in resistance has to be accurately measured. So you will require some kind of bridge arrangement and later on we shall discuss about the signal conditioning circuit where uh, the bridge arrangement can be used to measure uh, the changes in resistance value uh, so that you can track the temperature, you can find out the temperature. So resistance thermometer is one of the very popular uh, resistance thermometer. Then you have got thermistor. In contrast to a metal, thermistor uses semiconductor material. semiconductor material and here the uh, relationship of temperature is somewhat like this i t 1 by t where t is the absolute temperature is equal to a 0 constant a 1 log 2 uh, r t plus a 2 log uh, a 2 log 2 r t cube. So here as you can see not only it has got a negative temperature coefficient, but it is also nonlinear. Negative temperature coefficient. And nonlinear. If you plot the resistance versus temperature, this is your temperature. And here is the resistance then the curve will be somewhat like this. So as the temperature increases, the resistance goes down and it goes down nonlinearly. So in this particular case, you have to use some special type of technique for mapping the resistance to temperature. Whenever it is a linear device, then it is very easy uh, because, because of the linear relationship. But here it is not so. Uh, usually you have to use table lookup technique uh, for the for conversion of resistance to uh, temperature. Now uh, these things can be done with the help of software and however uh, this thermistor has been found to be very popular in, in, in very in simple equipment. For example in your transistor uh, radios in the earlier days to avoid thermal runaway, these thermistors were used to uh, sense the temperature of the uh, power transistors. So these thermistors are very low cost, high uh, these are of high sensitivity, they are very sensitive, m much more sensitive than your uh, resistance thermometers and also uh, very small in size. Usually it is available in the form of a small bead with two wires. And the size of that bead can be as small as 0 0.01 inch. So you can see the device can be very, very small. And it is made, made of sintered mixture of metal alloys. And that way, uh, you realize you make the bead and take two wires and the temperature of this varies according to this relationship. So thermistors are used in many low cost uh, equipment particularly because of these features, low cost, high sensitivity and small in size. However, you have to take care of the nonlinearity in the process. 
then comes the thermocouple thermocouple is used in particularly uh, for measuring high temperature of furnaces and so on because the temperature then is very high the principle of operation is based on this you have got two metal pairs with two contacts so here is one metal say this is metal a and there is another metal b and these two are uh, whenever these two are kept at two different temperatures say this is at t1 and this is at t2 and this is made of b then it develops some voltage or emf across it so you can get a voltage across these two junctions so the voltage developed between two voltage or emf developed between these two junctions can be measured and that the voltage depends on two parameters number one parameter is the temperature difference between the two and the metal pairs that is being used so uh, this emf or which is which is me measured by measuring the volt voltage with the help of a voltmeter you can use it uh, to measure the temperature difference usually one of the two temperatures it is kept at some reference temperature at 0 degree centigrade usually ice so one junction is kept at ice another junction is kept uh, at the temperature uh, you want to interested in measuring and you can see here the different types of metal pairs that can be used you can use iron constant and which gives you temperature range from minus 200 degree centigrade to 1300 degree centigrade and this is the emf developed whenever one junction this is done whenever that uh, t1 is equal to 0 degree centigrade and t2 is equal to 100 degree centigrade so that means the temperature difference between the two junctions is 100 degree centigrade and uh, in that condition it this these voltages are generated so you see iron constant and gives you 5.2828 millivolt this is in millivolt and iron constant has been found to be very economical in nature then comes the uh, chromel alumel which gives you uh, one is chromel another is alumel that gives you uh, temperature of minus 200 degree centigrade to plus 200 degree centigrade and emf generate is 4.1 volt millivolt it is also very linear then platinum rhodium platinum uh, here the range is 0 degree centigrade to 1500 degree centigrade and emf generated is very small as you can see 0 0.646 of course it can go up to high temperature 1500 degree centigrade then you have got copper constant and minus 200 which can operate in the range of minus 200 degree centigrade to plus 400 degree centigrade which gives you gives emf of 4.26 when the junction temperature um, difference is uh, 400 degree centigrade and it is suitable in moisture environment then tungsten rhenium where the temperature range is 0 degree centigrade to plus 200 degree 2000 degree centigrade and it is it can operate at a very high temperature but it got, did not get the emf value for this particular metal pair then you have got chromal constant and which can operate in the range of 0 degree centigrade to plus 1200 degree centigrade which gives emf of 6.3 millivolt and it is very sensitive among the all as you can see here it gives you maximum voltage uh, between these two junction 6.3 millivolt it is highly sensitive so thermocouple can be used also uh, for measuring the temperature and it is widely used particularly in furnaces for measuring the temperature of a furnace or <coughs> however you see uh, there is one drawback of this kind of circuit one junction has to be kept at reference temperature of 0 degree centigrade this however can be uh, overcome by using some uh, 0 degree or, or we can call it uh, low junction low temperature compensation we can use some special type of electronic circuitry which will replace uh, 
uh, this uh, reference temperature requirement that electronic circuitry will compen compensate that uh, this young, uh, that, uh, that uh, low temperature uh, compensation effect. So, that, that type of circuit will be required whenever you use thermocouple in your instrumentation or process control applications. Now, uh, in addition to this, there is another uh, type of transducers which are becoming more and more popular which are known as IC temperature transducers or IC temperature sensors. The principle of operations of IC temperature sensors is very simple. Whenever you have got two transistors, here you, there are two transistors. For one, the collector current is I1. For the other one, the collector current is I2. So, whenever these two transistors are operated at two uh, collector currents, then the base emitter junction voltage difference between the two, that means V, B, E difference has been found to be equal to K T by Q ln uh, I, I2 by I1. Since I2 by I1 is constant, K and Q are constant, K is Boltzmann constant, Q is charge of electron. So, this voltage difference between these two base emitter junctions is proportional to the absolute temp temperature. That is why these devices are known as PTAT, proportional to absolute temperature devices. And based on these principles, some integrated circuit chips have been developed, which produces either current or voltage proportional to absolute temperature. For example, you have got AD590 IC temperature uh, transducer or sensor which produces 1 microampere per degree centigrade and uh, it gives you high linearity of plus minus 0. Point uh, 3 degree centigrade over the full range, full temperature range. The full temperature range is minus 55 degree centigrade to uh, plus 150 degree centigrade. So, you see temperature range, range is not very high, it is quite moderate, but it is uh, quite uh, sufficient in many applications. Uh, minus 55 degree centigrade to plus 150 degree centigrade. That is the temperature range over which many applications are, are uh, many applications are developed or designed. So, this is one example. Then you have got uh, 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 other IC temperature sensors as well. For example, LM35. This LM35 gives uh, 10 millivolt per degree centigrade. It gives you 10 millivolt per degree centigrade and uh, on a, over the temperature range of minus 55 degree centigrade to plus 150 degree centigrade with similar kind of linearity and accuracy. Then you have got another device LM34 which gives you 10 millivolt per degree Fahrenheit and the temperature range is minus 50 degree Fahrenheit to uh, 230 degree Fahrenheit. So, these are the uh, different types of uh, IC temperature transducer available and the characteristics is quite interesting. So, here it is the absolute temperature and here is the voltage or current that is linear and it starts from 0 degree Kelvin to any high temperature. So, you see here, uh, here it starts from 0 degree Kelvin and that means 0, uh, 0 microampere or 0 millivolt is at 0 degree Kelvin. Then the, uh, and that is the, the, volt, the voltage or current generated is linearly proportional to the absolute temperature. So, uh, as a result, this is a very linear device and it is widely used. <coughs> and these are all about the uh, temperature sensors. Apart from ten temperature, you require many applications 
or many embedded systems where you have to measure the pressure, pressure, torque, displacement, these are essentially uh, use a similar kind of transducers. Let us see what are the different types of uh, transducers that you use, that you normally use for measuring pressure and displacement. Uh, for measuring pressure and displacement like force, torque, pressure and displacement, their measurement technique is similar. Usually the pressure, force, torque is converted into some kind of strain or displacement, then it is measured. And one of the most popular device is strain gauge. So, Whenever you uh, use some material, I mean subject some material to some stress, use some force or torque, there is some strain, change in the shape or size and that leads to change in the resistance. That is the basic principle of this strain gauge and which is represented by this gauge factor. Here it says that under the strain, if there is any change in length of delta L, where the nominal length was L, then the ratio of the delta by L, delta L by L, uh, this is the ratio and the change of resistance that takes place is delta R by R. Then this ratio of this these two values, delta R by R by delta L by L is known as the gauge factor. So, gauge factor is a representative parameter. which is used as a measure of the, the, the strain that takes place because of the stress under pressure or torque or something like that. And for that purpose, different materials have been found uh, which are used for making strain gauges, nichrome, constantin or isoelastic. These are the three popular metals which are normally used. Uh, this this particular alloy uh, requires ni nichrome and chromium 80 percent 20 percent gauge factor is 2.5 resistivity is 100 uh, per centimeter into 10 to the power minus 6 and uh, that is your ohm then your temperature coefficient is per degree centigrade into 10 to the power minus 4 is 1 so you can see here temperature coefficient is not very high and usable temperature is uh, up to 100, 1200 degree centigrade, for constant and it is up to 400 degree centigrade, for isoelastic it is 1200 degree centigrade. Uh, so, you see they have the different gauge factors, different resistivity and different temperature coefficients. Obviously, higher the resistivity, more accurately you can measure and as you can see here, this isoelastic gives you higher gauge factor means higher resistivity and more accurate measurement is possible, however, it has higher temperature coefficient. So, because of temperature change, the accuracy will degrade in case of isoelastic. So, you can choose one of the three types of uh, strain gauges for your application. Question is, how do you make or build strain gauges? For that purpose, you, will, you can use different techniques. One is coil type. So, on a thin sheet of plastic, you, you, you put a, you with the help of some adhesive, a very thin wire is attached. So, this is the coil type of uh, strain gauge configuration. It is in one dimension only or it can be foil type where the foil can be attached or by suitable technique and it can be deposited on the uh, thin foil. So, thin uh, plastic sheet, then it can be used as a strain gauge or you can stack two layers of coil or foil as you can see here it is 90 degree stacked, it is one in x direction, in, in y direction, another is in x direction. So, you can measure the uh, change in resistance values in both direction or the uh, strain that this particular uh, uh, device suffers because of some pressure or torque or here it is 90 degree stacked and here it is planar separated 
two separate areas, but in, in, in one, one case y direction and another case x direction. So, this strain gauge is wi very widely used in, in uh, making, measuring pressure, for example, in weighing bridges, strain gauge is used uh, to measure the pressure which is converted into weight. Now, uh, there is another important transducer that is, uh, that uses, uh, measures displacement. Actually, displacement transducers can also be used for measuring uh, force, torque and pressure. So, usually some force summing devices force summing devices like bellows or diaphragms these devices can convert the pressure or torque into displacement then the displacement can be measured and the displacement can be uh, used as a measure of the force or torque or pressure now uh, one very important device which is known as LVDT, which is very popular, uh, linear voltage, linear variable differential transducer, LVDT, linear variable uh, differential transducer. So, here the construction of an LVDT is shown. Here is your input applied to the prim primary of a coil. So, uh, on a cylindrical tube, a primary is uh, wounded and then you have got two secondary. You can see here there are two parts, two secondaries. And inside the tube, you can put a core uh, which is uh, uh, this core is in put inside the device, which is a ferromagnetic core, ferromagnetic core is uh, placed inside it. So, whenever it is centrally placed, this primary induces equal voltages on both the secondaries. And these two wires are connected in such a manner that the voltage, voltage whenever it is placed centrally, then the induced voltage on both the coils is same. So, you get 0 volt at the output. So, let me draw the characteristic card, it will be somewhat like this. So, at the center voltage is 0, but whenever this particular, uh, this is move, this goes up, or this goes down, this is connected to uh, that uh, diaphragm or bellow as I was telling. So, whenever this moves uh, inside the tube, either uh, in the this direction or the, up, uh, or the, uh, uh, the other direction, then it generates voltage and you get a uh, characteristic like this, symmetric characteristic. So, here is your uh, voltage. voltage and here is the, uh, in this direction is the displacement. So, for whenever it is centrally located, centrally placed, then voltage is 0. So, whenever it moves in either direction, voltage is generated. Let us look at the typical sizes of a LVDT device. The size is about 9.5 millimeter diameter and 15 millimeter long that means about 1 centimeter by 1.5 centimeter device not very big and core size is 2.5 millimeter diameter and length is 10 millimeter long primary resistance is about 120 ohms maximum input voltage is 6 volt that you can apply here you have to apply ac voltage because it is a transformer then sensitivity is 2.5 millivolt per, uh, per 25 micro inch. So, you can see here very small 
displacement can be measured with the help of device of this device and non voltage accuracy is 0.5 percent of full scale. So, it gives you quite accurate displacement measurement and millionity range is plus minus 1.25 millimeter and uh, it has got uh, the typical features like high sensitivity as I said sensitivity, high linearity as I have drawn high linearity, low impedance, this is the primary resistance and uh, you will require output re uh, impedance that will be or of the order of few ohms, few hundred, within few hundred ohms. So, low impedance uh, which is very important for measurement because lower the impedance uh, a better will be the uh, accuracy of measurement because it will be less. Um, less uh, it will be less prone to noise and other disturbances. So, low impedance then it gives you wide frequency range wide frequency range it is very simple in construction as a as a result it will be a low cost not very costly because of the simple construction and rugged, very rugged, it can be used uh, in industrial environment very easily. So, this LVDT is another important device which is used for measuring pressure, torque, uh, this, uh, which is converted into displacement, then the measurement is done. So, you have discussed two very important types of transducers and third type that we shall discuss is the uh, light transducers because you will see that uh, the measurement of light intensity is very important in various applications not only in control in sensing whether the lights are on in a room or not you can you can de design automatic uh, street light controllers by sensing the uh, ambient uh, light and whenever the light falls below certain level automatically this is a state light will turn on and light sensors are also used in medical instrumentation. So, uh, light transducers uh, uh, are very important and we shall discuss some of the light transducers. The simplest of them is possibly the photodiode. In a photodiode we have got two junctions, this is your semiconductor material, there is a junction P type and N type and th this is the diffusion region. Then you apply reverse bias voltage that means you have to make it negative and this is positive. Whenever you do that and put a resistance in series and apply a, a, micro, a micro ammeter, then you will find that whenever light falls on it, some current will pass. What is the principle of operation? Principle of operation of light, light sensitive devices is very simple. Whenever uh, light falls on the junction, some of the electrons attains energy that means the light energy that is your H nu gets converted into uh, I mean whenever it is sufficiently high. Uh, it and get up then the band gap E g, then the electrons moves from valency band to conduction band. And as a result uh, it leads to uh, your uh, electron hole recombination leading to flow of current. This is the basic principle of photodiodes and uh, here it is operated in the uh, reverse bias condition. What will be the characteristics of the device? It will be like this. So, 
uh, in the forward bias condition we are not using in the forward bias condition so we are it will be operating in this range and the current value will be uh, very small of the order of microampere so when the light intensity is very low reverse saturation current will be i1 then as the light intensity increases the current will be equal to i2 then as the more light intensity increases it will be i3 or i4 in this way the reverse saturation current increases or if you plot in some other way for example on this side you draw the uh, light intensity in the x axis and in this axis the reverse saturation current isc and the curve will be like this uh, here uh, i am not giving any scale so uh, the as the light intensity increases the current increases more or less linearly as you can see here this reverse saturation current then this reverse saturation can current can be considered as a measure of the intensity of light that is falling on it so this photodiode as you can see here is a passive device so it uh, it it will uh, produce current whenever it is some biasing is given and this current can be considered as a measure of the light intensity so this particular device is very low cost simple and small in size as a result this is widely used in many applications for sensing the light intensity then comes the solar cell solar cell is a photoconductive device uh, it is made in this manner uh, here you have the tn junctions as usual so this is your uh, p type p plus and n plus then and in the back side you have got a conducting plate so here you have you put a conductive back contact plate and there is a connection coming out of it and on top of this also there is a conductor in the form of a finger so it is given in the form of a finger and there is a contact why why the it is given in the form of finger sufficient sufficient area is left for exposing the junction so that the contactor does not obstruct so that the light falls uh, on the surface and goes to the pn junction and based on the same principle as i discussed in the previous case for photodiode the photon energy is sufficiently whenever it is sufficiently high greater than the band gap then the uh, then the current flow then will some voltage will be developed across it so there is a basic difference between photodiode and uh, solar cell here the junction area is large is large it generates voltage proportional to the light intensity and it is based on photo voltaic effect and as a consequence the uh, it is an active device active device means it does not require any power supply for its operation so we find that this is uh, this this particular device is very suitable uh, for not only for measuring the light intensity and this solar cells can be used widely used in houses and various other places as an alternated source of energy that's why uh, solar cell is becoming more very popular uh, 
uh, in many applications. Now, apart from solar cell, there is another uh, light sensor that is light dependent resistor. The light dependent resistor is made of cadmium sulfide. What is done? This cadmium sulfide is deposited on some ceramic in this form. Then through these two contacts, the connection is taken or it, it actually it will look like this. This is the material. Then two contacts are taken from both ends. And this, this cadmium sulfide has, has found to uh, the resistance of this material uh, varies with the light intensity, with the, li and the light incident on this. For example, whenever it is kept in dark room, then the resistance can be as high as 1 mega ohm or 2 mega ohm or something of, the, of that type. On the other hand, it is exposed to light, this cadmium sulfide it is exposed to light, then it gives you, uh, say, exposed to light, then it gives you 1 kilo ohm or it can be, say, 5 kilo ohm. So, resistance changes by 6 order of, 3 order of magnitude, 1 mega ohm to 1 kilo ohm that is exposed to light. So, this light dependent resistors or LD, LDRs are also widely used in various uh, applications to measure the light intensity. Now, before I conclude this lecture, I should discuss about uh, some key features of the these transducers. One important feature is whether it is passive or active. We have seen that some transducers do not require any external energy for its operation, which are based on photovoltaic effect or thermoelectric effect. For example, thermocouple or a photovoltaic cell, these are active devices. On the other hand, LDR, LVDT and various other transducers are, are passive in nature. Second important feature is size. The size of the device should be small so that the prevalent condition of the environment is not disturbed. For example, you are measuring the temperature of a uh, water bath. If the transducer is very big, then uh, the thermal capacity will be high and uh, then the it will uh, then the it will disturb the environment and so this kind of transducer is not suitable so size should be small then sensitivity so the sensitivity has to be measured sensitivity is very important because higher the sensitivity more resistance change more voltage change more current change will take place and you can measure it more accurately. So, sensitivity is very important uh, for transducers for accurate measurement of the parameter. Then dynamic range as we have discussed, the range over which the measurement can be done, this is also very important because the higher the temperature range it can be used, higher the dynamic range it can be used over a wide temperature range, light range or pressure range. Then repeatability. Repeatability is also very important because uh, you measure today, next time also it, it should give you a same and exact result. So, these are the parameters you have to take into consideration while choosing different types of transducers. Thank you.